This is the Economic Club of Florida, a distinguished platform for discussion of the major national issues of the day. On today's program, Lisa Ludolph Perlow of Celebrity Cruises on making cruise line travel safe again during the pandemic. Right now, a cruise ship is safer than Main Street. We have, you know, if, if you look at the entire population of a celebrity ship right now, 99% of the people are vaccinated. 100% of our crew are vaccinated and no less than 95% of our guests are vaccinated. That is how we're operating um, and that's how we will continue to operate. Good day and welcome to the 548th in our series of Distinguished Speaker Programs. I'm Harvey Bennett for the Economic Club of Florida. We're delighted to be talking about the return of cruise line vacations in Florida and honored to have with us today a leader in that effort, Lisa Ludolf Perlo, the president and CEO of Celebrity Cruises. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. It is so nice to be here with all of you today. I'll bet. Boy, it's, it's been a long 16 months with the no sale <laughs> order in effect because of the coronavirus pandemic. But you and your team found a way to become the first cruise line to resume sailing from a U.S. port, our own Port Everglades in Fort yeah. Lauderdale this past June. How did you do it? Uh, well, that, it wasn't easy and it wasn't for the faint of heart. But, you know, one thing that I can say about our company in general is that we have been planning this for a very long time. We took a lot of measures and did a lot of things that would put us in the position that when we knew uh, we would be able to sail again, we would be ready to go. Um, as you said, it's been a very long 16 months and we didn't want to wait one day longer than we needed to. So our teams worked around the clock, put together the protocols, got our crew ready, got them where they needed to be, got them vaccinated. Um, and when we got the green light and because we were sailing with such a high percentage of our guests vaccinated, we were able to start up pretty quickly. I know it had to have been a very complex situation. You had to juggle federal and state regulations, which you'll get into in just a few minutes in your formal address yeah. to the club. But, and I know yes. as well, I know as well, there were very specific protocols and scenarios that Celebrity uh, Cruises and your parent company, Royal Caribbean, have developed to keep everyone safe. And that you're going to explain that again in in just a few minutes before the club. You know, tourism is our number one industry in Florida. We know that the cruise line business supports nearly 160,000 jobs across Florida. A uh, quarter of that is across multiple sectors there where you are in Fort Lauderdale in South Florida. Lisa, that no sale order, that must have been very tough and had a big impact on celebrity and your employees. Sure, it uh, it really did. And it had... Uh, you know, it transcended our brand and our employees, of course, to our corporate brands and employees. Um, but for me, mostly it impacted our crew from many countries around the world who were out of work for 16 months. And then, of course, all of our stevedores and the people that support the ships and provision the ships. It was a really tough time for a lot of people who play a big role in this industry and, and in our operating. But you were able to take care of them to the point when you're able to get restarted, though. Well, our shoreside employees, yes. Our crew, though, was without work. And, of course, the people that um, that work at the port, Port Everglades and even Port Miami, um, they, you know, they they didn't uh, have work because we didn't have ship sailing and guests coming. And, you know, I, I remember when we started up and one of our guests asked the stevedores how it felt to be working again and just this big smile across his face and, you know, said he really had no words to describe it. So it was it was so wonderful to start up again for so many reasons. What a relief. Lisa, you have been president and CEO of Celebrity Cruises since 2014, becoming the first woman to serve in the top spot among the Royal Caribbean group lines. Tell us a little bit about your, your personal journey to the top. Well, I, um, I just celebrated my 36th anniversary with the company and almost seven of those years now in this role. And um, my career started back in New England, where I'm from, calling um, on travel agencies, knocking door to door, selling 
uh, that that's where uh, this great journey began. And throughout my, I guess, 30 years before I came into this role, I had many different positions, not only was it within sales, but within marketing and then within operations and then back and forth between the brands. So I've had quite a long and windy road in my career, but every single experience that I've had prepared me quite well for this position. And, um, and it's, you know, it's been a great ride. And I ended up someplace where, you know, 36 years ago, I never imagined I would be. That's terrific. And I know you're also going to talk in our upcoming address about the uh, equity that you've brought to bringing along other women to some of the top spots, especially in uh, operations. Yes, absolutely. Lisa Ludolf Perlow, President and CEO of Celebrity Cruises, thank you. We look forward to hearing your formal remarks and learning more about the return of safe vacation cruising. Yeah. Thank you. It's so exciting to be talking about that. Yes. Now, here's Doug Wheeler, immediate past president of the Florida Ports Council, with our formal introduction. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, amongst a lot of my colleagues and and my fellow ECF members. Um, uh, As you can see, our, our guest is not able to join us today, unfortunately. This is well, she's, she's joining us. She's joining us. She's just going to be joining us via that big television screen, um, which personally makes a fireside chat in that chair all by myself a little awkward, but uh, that's where we're at. So anyway, uh, Lisa Lutoff Perlow, uh, one of the few American women who is a current CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, she's literally a trailblazer in the global uh, hospitality industry. Uh, that includes both the marine side as well as the um, uh, hotel side. Uh, she is a recognized driving force behind transforming and really redefining uh, today's what they call new luxury uh, cruise experience. Um, she is an expertise in building demand, uh, unparalleled brand division, uh, vision, and award-winning guest service. Celebrity uh, no doubt has one of the best uh, reputations in, in the industry, uh, and a real innate ability to put together high-performing, culturally inclusive teams that reach a high level of success. Uh, she took the helm as President and CEO of Celebrity Cruise Lines, that's a Royal Caribbean Cruise Line company, uh, in 2014, and uh, truly led that company through an unprecedented era of growth. Um, They have uh, introduced under her leadership a new uh, series of vessels known as the Edge, and um, we're going to be talking a little bit about that vessel shortly. Uh, She's helped that company achieve historic levels of guest satisfaction, and they've won hundreds uh, hundreds of of top industries awards, uh, both for innovation as well as as service. Uh, She's on the board of directors of uh, AutoNation, a Fortune 500 company, which I think last I checked was up about a point today, at about 118 since we're at the Economic Club of Florida. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with AutoNation, but uh, she also lends her expertise to a lot of nonprofit groups, including the United Way of Broward County, um, the uh, Best Buddies Global Board of Directors, and Nova Southeastern's uh, Center for Innovation. She's been with this uh, company for 35 years, which I think even still today is, uh, you know, something that we're seeing less and less of. Uh, She has progressed through the company um, with uh, success in areas of sales, marketing, and operations, sort of increased oversight and responsibility as as she moved along through that career. Uh, She became Celebrity's first, you're going to see a theme here, first female senior vice president of hotel operations in 2005. In 2012, she was named the executive vice president for operations. Uh, for Royal Caribbean, the first woman to hold both the hotel and marine operation responsibilities. A short two years later, she was appointed to the first woman uh, CEO of any brand in Royal Corporation. Uh, She's known as a bold and strategic innovator uh, with an unwavering commitment to excellence and results. Uh, She's known for leveraging data when it comes to better understanding consumer motivations and evaluating campaigns. Uh, personalizing digital content, just really revolutionizing the customer experience. Uh, We talked about the new luxury rebranding. She also has a personal component, which we're going to talk about as well. Uh, This is a 200-year-old industry. In 2015, she appointed the first American woman as a captain of a celebrity cruise ship. 
and ultimately increased celebrities' percentage of women in the bridge, uh, women on the bridge, pardon me, from 3% to 27%. Um, the industry average is 2%. Uh, she's won numerous uh, awards from the hotel industry, the travel industry. Uh, she's won an honorary doctorate from Nova Southeastern, although earned probably not one. Uh, lifetime Achievement Awards from CLIA, which is the Cruise Line Association, uh, uh, and a very respected organization of her colleagues, uh, as well as Women in Travel. She's also a recipient of the uh, very prestigious Eleanor Roosevelt Center Val Kill Medal of Honor, which acknowledges uh, her far-reaching influence um, to make the world a better place. So uh, please join me in welcoming our guest, Lisa Lutoff Perlo, the President and CEO of Celebrity Cruise Lines. Welcome, Lisa. I wish you were here joining, but uh, here personally with us. But I know you uh, had some uh, logistical issues. Um, but thanks for joining. I know, I know the audience is eager to learn more about uh, you and Celebrity Cruise Lines and um, the resumption of cruising. We're, we'll talk about uh, from an industry that's just so vital to uh, Florida's economic um, uh, health. So I'm going to move over to my uh, fireside chat chair by myself over there. And while I do that, maybe give you a minute to just say, uh, make some uh, welcoming comments before, or opening comments before we get to the uh, questions. Sure, thank you. It's so nice to be with all of you today, even though virtually I know many of us are used to that by now, but it's still not ideal. And um, I really appreciate being asked to speak today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in person. I will do my absolute best to make this fireside chat as wonderful and intimate as possible, even though I'm not there in person. So, um, and I'm honored to be among this illustrious uh, group and I'm sorry you're all sweating. I, uh, I see that it's warm in there. And um, so hopefully this will be interesting and it will get your mind off of that. Not more than me. <laughs> well, Lisa, it's great. it's great that you could join us. And, and logistically, uh, you know, challenges or not, it's, it's great that you could join us today. And I know we're, Looking forward to a great discussion. So, why don't we uh, why don't we get started? Just tell us a little bit about Celebrity Cruises, right? The brand, because I know that is so key, uh, perhaps more to this than some of the other cruise lines. That, that Celebrity's brand. Um, who, who are your customers? Why? Uh, and then maybe what? Well, tell us a little bit what makes Celebrity different from the other cruise lines, including even some of the other Royal uh, lines in the parent company. Um, well, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll try to do it justice, and I'm not sure if there are any cruisers in the crowd and, or celebrity cruisers, but I certainly hope at some point in time you will give our industry and certainly our brand a try. You know, celebrity has, over the last seven years, we've really worked hard to carve out a nice niche for ourselves. It's called New Luxury. We really straddle, um, you know, we're, we're slightly underneath Ultra Luxury, which are very small ships. But, um, but also a, a nice step above premium cruise lines uh, that some of you might know out there. We've, we've taken an approach that we focus on five things that we believe are very important to our guests around the beautiful design of our ships. They're like boutique hotels and you know, we hire world-class uh, and world-renowned designers. And we might talk a little bit about that as we talk about the Edge series. Culinary, we are the culinary brand. We're highly awarded for that. We've won more Wine Spectator Awards than anybody else in the industry. Um, and we're the first to win certain awards from them for best of, which they really don't give to the cruise industry. Uh, where we go is really important to our guests, uh, but also how we take them into the places that we visit and engage with the local communities and make them better uh, for having been there versus just bringing our guests in and dropping them off and then taking them away. Um, service, again, is, is really at the, at the top of the list of everything that we provide. We're the first cruise line to be um, verified for luxury, if you will, by Forbes. And that's a, a really important distinction. And to your point um, earlier through that really lovely introduction, thank you. We also build our brand on a foundation of purpose and we try to make the world a better place while we're also offering these great modern uh, and new luxury vacations. Our, our target, our affluent customers, um, we primarily focus on the boomer and Gen X market. 
Uh, we do a lot of segmentation and data gathering around those two markets. And, um, and we've really built our brand in a, in a lovely and strong way over the last few years. And before this terrible pandemic that affected the entire planet uh, happened, uh, we had achieved some pretty transformational uh, financial results. And I'm looking forward to reinvigorating that in the very near future. Let's talk a little bit about, just so we can kind of set the stage as we continue to talk a little bit about yourself. Uh, a very, I mean, it's an impressive, impressive career, uh, a track, the progression that you, you've had. So talk a little bit about your, your career, this, this long and impressive career and what has traditionally been a, 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 a man-dominated industry. Um, and so a little bit about how you ended up where you are and then maybe some highlights from, uh, you know, along the journey. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, as you described, as you, as you were doing that lovely introduction, it's been a very long and winding road and um, a wonderful career, probably one I never imagined 36 years ago. And uh, I started uh, selling door to door as a district sales manager up in New England, where I'm from. Um, and uh, took my uh, first promotion moving down to Florida back in 1989. And then, you know, progressively worked through sales and then marketing and then operations. And I've also been back and forth between the brands a couple of times. And throughout that journey, um, I know there's, there's a lot of talk about the fact that I was the first woman to be in the C-suite of our company and run one of our brands. And that is a really lovely distinction. I never thought much about it along the way as, as a woman, especially when you come from a sales and marketing background, you really don't think about gender at all. But I, I do, uh, you know, I do acknowledge that when I did, when I came into operations, I think it was 2005, for the first time, it was a culture shock. And I understood how male dominated um, our industry was, but not only just male dominated, because I work with amazing men every single day. And the majority of people that I work with every day are still men. And they're fabulous and wonderful men. But these, you know, the men that I was working with at the time were not very progressive and not very focused on gender equality. Um, and they did not view women as being able or capable. And so as I transitioned into that environment, I knew I had an opportunity to change that. And when I came into this role, I knew I really had an opportunity to do that because it really does, influence does matter. And your ability to control certain environments and um, bring along like-minded people is that much greater when you have a position like I have. So I decided that um, I was going to use the fact that I was the first woman in this role and that it was bringing so much uh, focus and attention to me in that regard that I was going to use it and mostly to elevate and bring other women along with me. And I think I've done a pretty decent job of that over the last seven years. And I have a lot of great men to thank for uh, all the progress that we've made. Yeah, that's great. We're, we're going to drill a little bit into some of the work relative to, uh, I think the stat I used was, was a, from three to 27% in terms of the women on the bridge and just in the corporation, and just your uh, employee culture anyway. So we'll get into that uh, a little bit as well. Um, okay, so this pandemic, right? Uh, no sale order, shutdown, literally, there, you know, uh, nothing has happened in the cruise industry. Uh, give us some insight into guiding celebrity through what has been just an unprecedented challenge. Um, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the finance side of that, but also let's talk some about how it's affected uh, some of the company's employees, whether that's uh, the folks that work for, uh, you know, on land or those that are, that are at sea as well, which come from all over the world, by the way. So, so share some of your thoughts on, on that. Okay. Um, wow, that's a lot. And um, that's a lot. And I, I reflect quite often uh, on the last 16 months, as you can all imagine, it has been a t an unprecedented time for the world. It's been an unprecedented time for our country. It's been an unprecedented time for our industry. Um, in, throughout my career, I never thought our industry would shut down and certainly never because of a global pandemic. But that's you know, sort of where we found ourselves um, 16 months ago. And as we thought about how to come back, 
First of all, we had to think about how to shut down, get all of our guests and our crew home. That took months. Um, and a lot of that was based on not so much our own issues, but even the countries that we were repatriating our crew to. As you just mentioned, they're from 70 or 80 different countries. And we were dealing with global governments and uh, our guests couldn't even get home. Their countries wouldn't even take them home. And some of our guests lived on one of our ships for months before we could get them home to Colombia, actually. So it is, it was, you know, it was an unbelievable experience and we learned so much. And I hope we've all come out of this in a better place than, than we were for a lot of different reasons. Mostly, I would say, as it relates to leading a company or a brand through such a situation where, at the very beginning, you're so uncertain about what's going to happen and when you're going to get back in business. And every time you thought you were, something else happened. And, you know, the, the no sale order was extended. Um, people were starting to get concerned. Uh, they were uncertain about their own future. They were uncertain about the industry, including myself on some days. And, you know, we, what I learned about being a leader during that time was that you really had to find a way to motivate, you know, at Celebrity, it's 20,000 employees, but not just the employees at Celebrity. You know, our company has on, on like 90,000 employees all over the world, and you needed to keep your crew motivated in all these different countries with constant communication and letting them see you and, and hear you through video and apps so that they could feel your energy and, and have hope that they were going to come back. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute because I've been on a couple of the ships and I just can't tell you how wonderful it is to see how happy and grateful our crew is. It's just, it's heartwarming. And for me, that was the, you know, listen, it's well, been well reported that this industry has had to borrow billions and billions of dollars to stay afloat, and pardon my very bad pun, and that we have to now pay this back um, over a period of time, and, that, and, and we didn't expect to have to do that. But, and so it's certainly wonderful to be back in business for that, so that we can start seeing our way through this really difficult time. But for me, it's always been about the people and being just so grateful that we've been able to bring them back. And um, I've learned a lot about myself during this time. I've learned a lot about what it takes to be a great leader during this time. And I've taken, you know, it's, uh, I've really spent a lot of time focusing our team on the future versus the terrible situation that we have been in on any given day. And then, and then just to finish up on the point, I, did, I don't want to go on and on about it too long. I think our company did all the right things. Not only in terms of how we took care of our guests and our crew, but also how we thought about coming back into service and putting together this healthy sale panel and working with experts in the field about what are, what are the things we should be thinking about so that we actually can get back into service and work closely with the CDC to ensure that our environment was safe and healthy and um, and and just continue to maniacally focus on that. I think it was the reason that we have been able to come back and to be able to come back so successfully and also in many cases for celebrity to be the first to come back. And so I would say that just like every other thing our company has done in the, in the 36 years that I've been with this company, we've gone above and beyond um, and we have led the industry in a way that um, has made it possible to finally be back in business, uh, which I have to say feels, feels really good. It, it should, and that's no no easy feat. Congratulations to you and, and all the team, and, and really all the the cruise lines. I, you know, a lot of people don't realize the trickle down. Uh, in my time at the council, we were hearing, you know, uh, the agriculture industry was beginning to feel the pinch that you know these cruise lines or their provisioners were not buying these massive amounts of tomatoes and you know peppers and all these fruits that go with you know a a weekly cruise that come and go every week, you know, at six or seven ports around the entire state, the country. And so, you know, you start to really realize it's not just the cruise lines that are feeling this, but it's it's all the people that are tied to that industry. And those, that second tier, if you want to call it uh, indirect or direct, uh, it's just a massive, massive uh, 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 community in, in Florida in particular. And they certainly were feeling the, the, the downturn effects as well. So. Um, job well done, and I'm sure it feels really, really good to start seeing uh, vessels out there. If I could, if I, if you don't mind, if I, I could address that for a moment, because you're absolutely right. The downstream impact 
of our industry being out of business, you know, all of our friends in the ports who have supported us over time, whether it's the port directors or the port offices and seeing their revenues impacted so significantly. The stevedores, they're so happy to be back to work. You know, our guests are our guests are so happy to be cruising again and they're talking to, to the, the folks that have been out of work for so long, asking them, what does it feel like to finally be back to work? And, you know, the tears, I mean, everybody's crying. The stevedores are crying. The captains are crying. The guests are crying. The crew is crying. It's been, you know, and all of our suppliers who provision our ships, it's been, it's really been hard. And um, this industry was hard, hit terribly hard. The state was hit terribly hard. And, um, and, you know, the economic impact of Florida was significant. And um, we're just, we're just glad that uh, it's finally on its way on its way back and slowly but surely every week more and more cruises are starting up again so you know there's light at the end of the tunnel it's slow slow but steady yeah absolutely our members may have seen last week uh, the governor was uh, able to award some federal stimulus money to uh, some of our seaports as sort of a revenue replacement or a supplement uh, to some of the revenue losses so that's certainly a big boost and then of course now that we have the vessels sailing again uh, i know our ports are also really excited so you know look there's still a lot of uncertainties probably endless uh scenarios of you know what if and what if this and what if that but um i know we have cruisers uh, in the audience let's take a good bit of time let's really because I, I want it's, it's so key that, right, I read a quote today that said, cruisers are going to cruise, right? So we, we know that the people that cruise, they're ready. They want to cruise. They love it. Um, but they need to be assured. And then that huge market that, that's not been on a cruise right now needs to be convinced, hey, come experience this, but come experience it safely. So take some time to walk through some of the protocols that we're, we're going to see uh, relative to, to boarding, I know there's new queuing processes, uh, reboarding after excursions, testing, uh, proof of vaccination requirements, which I know is a little tricky issue right now, but uh, cleaning processes, right? I'm, I'm assured buffets will exist, you just won't serve yourself, right? So if you want 16 pieces of bacon, you gotta ask for 16 pieces of bacon, but you can still have it. So. Spend some time, and then, and then I want to close with that, take some time, but then I also want to get to the point that I think a lot of people are curious about. So I'm on a cruise, we've set sail on day two, somebody on the ship tests positive for the COVID virus. What happens to that person, and how does that, might, might that affect the rest of the, of the passengers? So I know that's a lot, but take, let's take some time, take your time, and let's see if we can't get through some of this and, and assure people that cruising is, is safe right now. Oh wow, you really do load me up, don't you? But that's okay. All right, let me let me let me try to let me try to wrap my head around that and and start and 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 where I, where I hope it makes sense. So yes, um, when when this first happened, we were very concerned that the first time cruise market was going to take forever to get back, and. Um, you know, we, as you can imagine, we do take a lot of time and spend a lot of energy gauging consumer sentiment, how they're feeling at any given time about anything. And we did that at the very beginning and we just continue to do that all the way through um, to where we are today and we will continue to do it. And, you know, it's it will be no surprise to anybody in the room that from where we were to where we are, we are light years, you know, we're at pre-pandemic levels of consumer confidence, which is really good to see. And those consumers are cruisers and non-cruisers. So it's, it's general population because we really need to understand what the general population is thinking. What's been really interesting for me as I have uh, watched our brand start up again and ask about the, the, you know, the specifics about the people that are on the ships you would think it's all past cruisers and it isn't. And I think one of the reasons that it isn't, and one of the reasons I was just on Celebrity Edge with 14 of us, it was our first you know, family cruise. It was the, um, just a couple of weeks ago. And I was really surprised at the number of first timers. And it's because they know what we're doing on board to keep them safe. You know, Our chairman has always said, we want to make sure that the public understands that a cruise ship is safer than Main Street. And right now, a cruise ship is safer than Main Street. We have 
you know, if, if you look at the entire population of a celebrity ship right now, 99% of the people are vaccinated. 100% of our crew are vaccinated and no less than 95% of our guests are vaccinated. That is how we're operating um, and that's how we will continue to operate. And we, and so people feel, and, and no one ever said there would not be a case on board. That's unrealistic and it's not, and it's not gonna happen. I mean, you know, we all are watching what's going on in Florida right now. And so the thing is though, people understand that but they also know that the environment they're in is very safe. And, you know, if you think about those 16 pieces of bacon, it's really good on our food cost um, because we're, our, our crew is actually serving. And so they'll give three or four, but not 16. And so, so maybe that will, that will help us on the cost side, but you know, it's for us at celebrity, it's lovely because, you know, we're always serving our guests. And so I, it's probably a nicer experience to be served versus serving yourself. And so while there are a few of those nuances, the experience is a wonderful experience on celebrity because of the very high vaccination rate. And again, we're working in conjunction with CDC. We're voluntarily following all of their um, recommendations and um we do the, the guests do not have to wear masks so their experience is not compromised um we are we are now because of the delta variant also not only requiring proof, proof of vaccination but also a negative test and a general pcr when you come to the pier just as an added level of um certainty that people aren't uh bringing uh this onto the ship and we have had some cases uh celebrity millennium was the first ship to sail out of North America, out of St. Martin. And on that very first cruise, we had a positive case. But that case is um, quickly identified. Close contacts are quickly identified. We have contact tracing. Um, we test everyone. They've all been negative. And we fly that person home by, we medevac them home. And so we have not had a situation where this has turned into um, any, anything other than one or two cases on board and the ships are handling them very well. The sanitation protocols are second to none. Our medical facilities have all been upgraded. Um, so it's really a very, very healthy and safe environment on board. And while we will have the few cases, they're being handled exactly the way they need to be and the protocols are all working. So um, again, if you think about 3,000, the population of three or 4,000 people on a ship between crew and guests, and you see one or two breakthrough cases from a pretty much fully vaccinated uh, population. I think that's the, the, those statistics are, are pretty good. So correct me if I'm wrong. So as they make, uh, as they uh, disembark and embark from excursions, they're not, they're not being retested as they reboard the vessel, or they are. If, if they get off to go to you know into the town for the day, and now they're coming back and sailing out tonight. Um, is it because they've already produced a negative test and been vaccinated that they're not required to take another test or would they be tested again before they can report? So um, you do not, you, if you're sailing out of a U.S. port with 95% or greater vaccination rate of your guests, you are not required to test people before they get on the ship or before they get off the ship or when they get on or off in a port of call. We have chosen, again, to go above and beyond compliance, if you will, or recommendations, just to continue to provide the safest um, environment possible. We have asked our guests, based on the, uh, the Delta variant, to please also not only come with proof of vaccination, but also a negative PCR or antigen test. And that is the only test that will happen on the cruise for that guest out of a U.S. port. It's different if guests are flying to Athens, for example, to board our Celebrity Apex. The, uh, Greece requires a negative PCR test, and we do test our guests before they get off the ship 48 hours in advance so that they can fly home um, because uh, it is still um, required to fly home to have a negative test. And the same for St. Mark. So it, it really depends on where you're going. So as you can imagine, as I'm talking through all of this and you're sitting in the audience, you're thinking, holy crap, that's a lot to keep track of. That's a lot to enforce. That's a, those are a lot of protocols and they vary wherever you are in the world. So we are navigating, again, a, I'm sorry for the, the, the very bad pun, um, a lot right now, but, uh, but it's still, um, 
you know, it's really still worth it. We're able to provide people much needed vacations. There's a lot of pent up demand out there. And, you know, it's, it's really helping us get back into service in a really big way for 2022 to be starting up and, and, um, and having this much success all over the world. It's great. It's great to see the uh, amount of uh, bookings. I mean, you know, business is really, really strong right now, so it's great. So let's keep our fingers crossed and let's hope that these these protocols in place that you, you briefly mentioned, I forget the name of you, but I know that uh, Royal put together a, a team of, of doctors and health experts and hospitality experts that kind of come up with. So we'll hope that these new, new protocols based in, you know, uh, science and, and medicine and so forth will, uh, will prove to be effective. Okay, so uh, moving on a little bit, uh, I do want to give you another chance to just talk about, um, you know, why you as a professional have felt so compelled to not only make sure that you're uh, being inclusive of, of women and, and their role in this industry, but uh, you, you focus a lot on cultural inclusivity uh, and, and gender equality issues and making sure that um, your the culture that you create is, is inclusive and supportive. Uh, and so talk a little bit about why that's so important to you and talk about some of those successes. Thank you for that question. It is important to me for a lot of different reasons. Diversity and inclusion in general are really important to me. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the gender side um, of when I came into operations, but what I also have really appreciated about our industry, especially leading the operation and leading so many different people from so many different parts of the world, you know, I, I, I grew up this way, believing um, in equality and believing in diversity and believing in inclusion. But it really hit home for me in our industry when I look at 80 cultures on our ships coming from different parts of the world. They are different colors. They are different genders. They have different sexual orientations. They have different religious beliefs. And they come onto these ships as strangers and they very quickly become family. And they're taking care of each other and they're taking care of our guests. And I thought... You know, I think the world could learn a lot uh, from cruise ships in that regard as well. But I also gained a whole new appreciation for that. And I also gained an appreciation for the fact that there were so very, so very few women um, in positions of influence and leadership on board our ships. And so as I thought about um, how to ensure that our brand, not only for the consumers, was a very welcoming place so that um, guests who were booking vacations knew that um, they would be comfortable and respected on a celebrity cruise. And so that's certainly part of our platform and something that I stand for and our brand stands for. And, you know, we're not, we're not shy about talking about that. And when I was on Celebrity Edge, I think it hit me for the first time how really diverse our guest mix was. And it was just a beautiful thing to see. In terms of gender equality, you know, I'll, just, I'll give you just a couple of quick examples. You talked about it in the introduction. When I was first appointed to this position in December of 2014, one of the things that I knew it was really important for me to do as, a, as the first woman and CEO in our company for one of our brands was to find a woman for a captain. And it's not easy, you know, I know we talk about those percentages and, and maybe for the audience to think about 2%, that's horrifying. We were at 3%, but it's not easy to go from 3% to almost 30% um, in five or six years because the women, the number of women were opting into these um, roles and professions, it's, it's very small. You know, if you look at the maritime universities and the engineering schools, you still have very few women in them. Uh, maritime universities, maybe 10% of the student body are women and maybe 7% get all the way through graduation. So the pool that you're drawing from is, is not very, very big. But um, I was very fortunate to meet Captain Kate at Royal Caribbean. She was a staff captain. She was a staff captain for nine years. I, I met her. I realized she was very special. Um, I, I even then, though, didn't realize how very special she is. And I, one of the first things I did was call her and say, Kate, would you, uh, would you join me at Celebrity as a captain? What was really interesting and disappointing to me is she had been a staff captain at Royal Caribbean for nine years and was the top rated staff captain, 13 contracts in a row. And I always say everything happens for a reason. And um, she wasn't promoted at Royal Caribbean, but um, I reached out and her answer was hell yes. 
and she was the first uh, woman, American woman, to uh, be the captain of a mega cruise ship. And believe it or not, she's still the only one, you know, six years later. Um, so we've worked with... Um, We've worked with maritime academies around the world and hired women at entry level positions so we could groom them and promote them over time. We have a woman captain in the Galapagos and we have a woman staff captain, Maria from Spain. Um, we uh, have women from all over the world on our bridges now and on any given ship at any given time, 30% of the, of the bridge team are women. And uh, two other very quick stories on that. I was doing a leadership talk for the Mandela Fellows at FIU in July of 2016. I was asked to speak. Um, this was a program, I think a thousand students out of 40,000 applicants uh, were admitted to the program. They went to different universities around the country. Uh, I spoke at FIU and I met a young woman named Nicoline, young woman from Africa. And she had her master's degree. She had worked on cargo ships. She was a professor at the Ghana Maritime Academy. And she told, stood up and gave me a very long and very sad story about her dream of working on a cruise ship. And every time um, she expressed her dream to any of the men that she worked with, they told her it was never going to happen. You need to go home and get married and have babies. And oh, by the way, women are bad luck on, crew, on ships. And so she asked me at that time if I could help her. And so of course, you know, I'm tearing up a little and she was crying and I said, let me see what I can do. And the, the, the 40 students that were there stood up standing ovation. And I went back to the office and I talked to Patrick, our Swedish head of Marine. And I said, Patrick, you need to help me hire Nicolene. And he said, okay, Lisa. And uh, he went to work doing that. And he, you know, he went and found Nicolene. I had all of her information. He came back to me about a week later and said, bad news. I said, what? And he said, Ghana is not recognized by the International Maritime Organization. We cannot, the industry cannot hire cadets from Ghana. And oh, by the way, Malta, our flag state also has not recognized so for one year, I said, well, Patrick, we're just going to have to fix that. And so he said, OK, I'll, I'll do that. And one year later, one year and one month, August of 2017, I greeted Nicolene um, on the bridge of Celebrity Equinox. Patrick had finally um, petitioned and got the IMO to recognize the Ghana Maritime Academy. Our flag state um, recognized the Ghana Maritime Academy. So one of my proudest days was when I saw five young Black women kneeling in front of the Ghana Maritime Academy sign with a celebrity flag. And uh, we have hired six or seven uh, of those uh, graduates of the Ghana Maritime Academy across our fleet during that time. Um, and it was, um, it was just a really lovely uh, thing to see and a lot of progress. You know, women of color along with women are also on the bridges of celebrity ships. And so, uh, it takes focus, it takes purpose, and it takes, you know, it takes all, all people wanting the same thing to make something like that happen. And so that's sort of, that's how we've done that over the last seven years or so. That's great. That's, that's a great story and a, and a great uh, kudos to you uh, uh, on your career and, and what you've been able to do to uh, not only help the, uh, the women get in the industry, but I think it will better the industry as a whole. So congratulations to you on that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the edge. Let's take one or two minutes to talk about this new series of investments that you have at the edge. Uh, I know it's got the magic carpet, which is uh, you know unique to to celebrity certainly. So brag on that for a minute or two, and then I seriously have to open up to the floor for questions, or I might not make it out of here. So take a couple minutes to talk about the edge, and then we'll we'll go to uh, member questions. Okay. Um, all right, quickly, I uh, came into the role, as I said, in late 2014, the GA, General Arrangement of Celebrity Edge, was in the, uh, in the room that, uh, you know, that where all the meetings happen, where we talk about these ships, and I thought about the impact that I could make as the leader of celebrity and what these ships meant to the future. Um, for, of the brand, they needed to transform celebrity. We really needed that, that accelerator, if you will, to just completely change the trajectory of celebrity. 
And so we got to work on Celebrity Edge and we uh, redesigned the ship at the time uh, from what it was supposed to be to what it ended up being. And we put, uh, you know, we really wanted this to be the epitome of new luxury for the brand. And so it starts with design and we hired world-renowned designers to help us. Um, it started with innovative features that uh, the you know, that our guests told us were important to them, starting with the stateroom. So we uh, found a way to create uh, a situation where we completely re-engineered the ship and the verandas became part of the room or could be separated off as a veranda. We call those infinite verandas. First time an ocean going vessel did that and one of the most uh, transformative and innovative features of the ships. Um, the dining experience was elevated. And, uh, and we, you know, we really thought about the programming and, and what these ships were going to mean, not only to the brand, but the, to the consumers that we were after. You know, I think that's the most important thing. If you think about how any brand, any of us that are responsible for brands, think about the future of your brands, you have to think about, you know, what are people going to want in five years? What are people going to want in 10 years? The lead time from when you design a ship to when it actually hits the market is a very long time. And you can only learn so much through consumer research. You know, our chairman always says, and this is so true, if, you know, if Henry Ford asked you know, people, what they wanted, they would say a faster horse. And so when you're in this business of innovation and when you're trying to think about the consumer you're going after and what they're going to want, you really have to look five, six, 10 years down the road to make sure that you're hitting what, um, you know, what you believe they, they want. And Celebrity Edge uh, received over 80 awards in its first year of operation. And it really only was one year because then, you know, our industry shut down. She was delivered in December of 2018 and we shut down in March of 2020. Uh, so she didn't have very long uh, in operation, but during that time she won almost a hundred awards. And in her first year of service, she was named as Time Magazine's top 100 places in the world to visit. And so um, I think that that speaks volumes about what we accomplished with that, not only design, but also with the programming and experiences that the amazing team of people I get to work with every day put together for, for our brand. And oh, by the way, I think the business case said we would pay the, those ships back in seven or eight years and we were paying them back in five. So um, yeah, so the financial performance of those ships far exceeded anything we had possibly imagined. And I gotta say, you know, for all of us that do this for a living, that, that felt really good. It sails out of Port Everglades, is that correct? Yes, it does. So um, thank you. Yes, it does. It was the first ship to sail out of a U.S. port on June 26th. That was so exciting. I was so happy for the ship, for Captain Kate, for our industry. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. And, uh, you know, and, and the, the press, you know, at the very beginning of this, the, you know, the press was was pretty hard on us. But I have to say they've been so wonderful as we've come back into service. They're looking for positive stories and positive news. And it really has been that. So, yes, she sails out of Port Everglades for the winter season, but she'll be back over in Europe um, in spring of 2022. So you'll get to sail on these beautiful ships uh, with her sister ship, Celebrity Apex. And then we have Celebrity Beyond coming out uh, in April of 2022. So we're still building ships. We're still focused on the future. It is bright. That's great. It looks like that's a, a smart smart play on Celebrity's part. So, okay, so uh, I guess we're going to very quickly turn it over. Marty, do you want to run questions? Uh, Lisa, thank you very much for the time. It's been great chatting with you today. I really wish we could have been sitting with you today. Uh, it's been a good chat, and stay tuned. We got a couple questions for you. Great. Is there any questions from anybody in our audience? Please go up, Matt. Go ahead. Line up. After. Hey My name is Matt Newman. I'm uh, formerly the executive director of the Florida Transportation Commission. So I certainly understand the challenges that your industry has faced for the last year and a half. But on a personal note, I, I grew up in Panama, and with the Panama Canal as a backyard. And my brother is a Panama Canal pilot. So he's certainly uh, not been able to uh, pilot any of your vessels uh, for the last year and a half. And I know that he's looking forward to that again. But um, on a, because I have a political science degree, I'll ask you a political question. Uh, 
obviously your industry has been impacted by the governor's decision regarding the vaccine passport. What what can you what can you tell us about how your industry has been dealing with that? Thank you. So I knew that I was going to get that question, um, and I still showed up today. Um, so um, you know, listen. As you can imagine, we are. Uh, you know, I talked about all the different governments all over the world that we're working with and and um, and cooperating with so that we can get back into service. We're working with the CDC because they are the leading health experts in the world. And, you know, they have worked really hard with us over time to give us a list of recommendations or requirements um, that we are voluntarily following so that we provide a safe environment. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the governor in the state of Florida say, it doesn't matter what the CDC says, our business depends on operating in a safe and healthy environment so, the, the, so that the, the school of public opinion wants to cruise. I mean, we need consumers to want to cruise. But we, you know, we, um, we are also working within the parameters right now of the state of Florida. And the state of Florida does not tell us we can't ask they tell us we can't require. And so we are working within those constraints to ensure that we um, live up to our commitment as a brand that we will sail at at least 95% vaccinated. Um, and in working with the governor's office, uh, you know, we have implemented different protocols for non-vaccinated guests. Um, and so many are, op not, are opting not to cruise because of those additional protocols. And we're also working with the governor's office because we do have ports of call that will not allow any unvaccinated guests into their ports. And so that becomes another barrier for unvaccinated guests. And, um, and uh, we're working with the governor's office on that. So nothing's been easy. You know, nothing has been easy with, with whoever is, um, is, you know, putting laws, requirements, recommendations, executive orders in place, but we're finding our way. And so while it hasn't been easy, we're still able to do exactly what we said we were going to do and, um, and provide a, a safe and healthy environment for our guests. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? Thank you. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for being with us. Um, we appreciate your insights and your information that you gave us today. It's very helpful. I think all of us are looking forward to getting back to cruising. And Jane Wingo moves that we adjourn. Thank you. You've been listening to Lisa Ludolph Perlow, President and CEO of Celebrity Cruises, speaking before the Economic Club of Florida on August 10th 2021 in Tallahassee, Florida. For more information on Celebrity Cruises, visit CelebrityCruises.com. The Economic Club of Florida promotes interest and enlightenment on important economic, political, and social issues of the day. To learn more, including how to become a member, visit our website at economic-club.com. This program was recorded at the Florida State University Alumni Center in Tallahassee, Florida.